feel more um, at risk. And so the intent will be that in each church, the front pew um, will be available and set up so that there is six feet. Um, it'll mean that there's six feet between the front row and, and the pulpit area. And then we'll make sure there's six feet behind before the next row starts. And then after that, we'll do the every um, the, the new uh, seating arrangement. But uh, as, I, as I said, our intent is that we're not going to be, um, you know, now that the mandates will be gone, we're not going to be saying, you know, sit with um, family or households or bubbles. It'll be um, up to you as to what your comfort level is for seating or who you sit with. Um, other than that, you know, we'll maintain some sanitizing, you know, we will cut back on, on the sort of everyday sanitizing, but of course, encourage good hygiene, um, including staying home if we're ill. Um, I'll let you read through the rest that's there, but if anyone has any questions, you're welcome to contact myself or certainly our board. Finally, um, I, we've received a thank you card. Um, Debbie McDougall's given us a thank you card, and I'll just read it here. It says, thanks so much. A grateful heart has lots of room for happy thoughts and joy to bloom. And it says, Bitterford Pastoral Church. So thank you for the special way you added sunshine to my day. Thank you for the beautiful roses and gift cards. It was so nice of you. God bless, Debbie. Are there any other announcements? And let us continue with our time of worship. Sometimes the shadows surround us. Sometimes it's difficult to see the light. Today we light this candle to remind us that even when it seems impossible, love does overcome, for Christ is our light. We have been on a journey. But we have reached our destination. Sometimes our journey takes us where we do not expect to go. But with Christ, there is always more to come. Our first hymn is number 326. O oh, four thousand tongues to sing.
and for all the ways you continue to give us hope in times of despair, love in times of loneliness, and light when the shadows close in. Be with us this day as we worship together in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now we come before God in this time of confession. Let us pray. We travel the long road of life together, O God. We follow the road with its twists and turns, wondering where it will lead. Then we find our way to what feels like the end, a dead end. We still see suffering and hatred, innocent people dying and wonder, is this all there is? We find ourselves with wanting to give up in despair, but then we hear your words. See, I am about to do a new thing. Forgive us, O God, when the dark shadows of this world overtake us. Forgive us and help us to cling to your promise to do a new thing. Amen. In Christ is the gift of new life. In Christ is the promise that we can be made new. In Christ there is forgiveness. Our hymn is number 612, There is a Balm in Gilead. I am about to do a new thing. 
Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people who I formed for myself so that they might declare my praise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now, uh, uh, Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. And finally, a reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 1 to 27. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister of Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill, so the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and you're going there again? Jesus answered, Are there more not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep but I'm going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I'm glad I was not there. So you might believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So let us pray. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So next week will be Palm Sunday, 
The next step in our Lenten journey that celebrates the story of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which means that our Lenten sermon series is starting to draw to a close. Over the last few weeks, we've been reflecting on the image of journey as we seek to walk with Jesus, an image that's familiar to us when we think of the stories of Jesus, as he traveled about the countryside teaching and helping others. And so our journey has helped us to consider how this image reflects our own personal and spiritual experiences in life, while also encouraging us to consider ways we can find strength and nourishment as we travel along. Last week, our focus shifted a bit as we considered the question, what happens when we feel lost? A tough question, yet one that reflects what all of us have experienced at different times in life where we feel lost, afraid, unsure of how to move forward. Which leads us to our final theme. Is this the final destination, or is there more? In many ways, these two themes are connected. Last week, we talked about how difficult it is when we feel lost, and the need is along with the need to support one another along the way which led us to consider how we as a community can help each other. But this week our focus invites us to move beyond our more individual personal experiences to the world around us. Those times when we feel overwhelmed by the overall suffering and brokenness that is around us. Because if we're being honest, there's a lot of suffering happening every hour of every day. All we have to do is turn on the news or look at videos and stories on the internet to know that this is true. From poverty concerns to gender inequality, oppression towards minorities here at home and around the world, hunger, and then there's war. Wars that are happening not just in Ukraine, but in so many other places as well where innocent people are targeted as they try to go about their daily lives, all while those with power try to justify it through various ideologies and religious views. And so when we hear all of these stories of suffering on a daily basis, it can lead us to despair. It can leave us asking the very question I've posed, is this all there is? In these moments of despair, though, we can find the words of today's psalm reading on our lips. The psalmist, in their own state of turmoil, writes, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Out of the depths of despair and suffering, we too cry out to God. We cry out asking why. We wait for an answer. Sometimes it feels as though no answer comes. In the short reading, the psalmist speaks <clears throat> about what we sometimes find difficult to express for ourselves. And this is one of the things I think is so beautiful about scripture, but as, as long with other forms of writing and poetry, is that they speak to our own inner turmoil to help us take what is on our hearts and to lift it up to God. Yet even in this passage, the psalmist does not fully give in to despair. Instead, they finish by writing, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. The psalmist proclaims that even in the midst of despair, they wait and hope for the morning, for a new day to begin, for another chance at overcoming suffering, which is exactly what our Easter faith offers us. In another week, we begin the journey of Holy Week, walking with Jesus to Jerusalem and the cross, <clears throat> a horrible time in the Christian year that asks us to come face to face with suffering and extreme violence. Stories that are never easy to hear or read, no matter how many times we do so. Yet we know what comes after. We know the Easter stories, 
We know that the cross and death did not have the final word. And so this is where we find our hope. When we feel overwhelmed by the suffering of the world, we find hope in Christ whose love was much stronger than any evil enacted upon him. All of which we can see not just in the Easter stories, but in many of the passages that tell us about Jesus' ministry. A reading today from the Gospel of John is one of those passages. It's a different resurrection story, and I only read part of it, that happens before Jesus' death and his resurrection. This one involves his good friend Lazarus, who becomes ill while he's away doing ministry, while he's away caring for others. The story is a powerful one filled with all of the emotions that come with death and suffering, despair, and hope. We're told that Lazarus, in this time, succumbs to his illness, and that they then bury him in the family tomb. Known and seen as a healer, Jesus arrives to the family home only to face the despair and, in many ways, understandably, anger of his two other friends, the sisters of Lazarus, Mary and Martha. Martha comes out to meet him and immediately declares, Lord, if you had not been here, or sorry, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Hearing these words, we can imagine and relate to the anguish behind them. We can imagine she may have been thinking, we sent for you. We told you what was happening, yet you didn't come. Why? Why did you not come? Anger, confusion, hurt can all be heard in these words. Yet even in her suffering, Martha holds on to her trust and hope in Jesus. That this isn't really the end. And that there is more to come. To which Jesus then proclaims that those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. Words that come to life with the conclusion of this story, which is after what I read today, where we're told that Jesus does indeed bring new life to, Naz to Lazarus and returns him to his family. I chose this reading because although it's a pre-Easter story, it helps us to express our Easter faith, which is that even in the face of death and endings, something more is around the corner. Even in the midst of immense grief and suffering, death does not have the final word. Even if in the moment it feels as though it does. And so we're invited to hold on to the words of Martha, who hold on to hope even when it felt hopeless. Which leads us back to our central question for today. This story reminds us that we're called on as Christians to keep watching and waiting for glimmers of hope that exist around us. Even when we find ourselves struggling to understand such senseless violence and harm. Because when we keep our eyes open for signs of hope and love, it can help strengthen us as we answer Christ's call to take to our part in creating a world that is more just and loving. Because this is what we're called to do. To be co-creators of a world where peace reigns and where suffering is no more. Just as Christ chose to do in his earthly ministry and continues to do in us and through us. And it's also the message that comes through with the stories of Holy Week. On the night before his death, Jesus knew what was coming. Yet he continued to teach and live a life of love. In the face of his own death, he spent time with those he cared for, including those who would betray him. He sought to remind them of what his ministry was all about, love and servanthood. And so it leaves us with this question, how do we do the same? When we feel helpless, how do we find a way to still make a difference? How do we hold on to hope? 
As the psalmist says at the end of Psalm 130, my soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Even though it's difficult, sometimes it begins with waiting and watching. Watching for the signs that morning has come, for those small glimmers of hope which lets us begin again, and to see once again that good still exists. Because when we do, it is in those moments that can keep us going. So in the moments of heartbreak, pause in your day. Watch. Wait. Look for those acts of kindness that do exist, which makes a difference in the lives of others. And remember that each small act of kindness you offer also contributes to a more loving world. Sometimes it's as simple as a compliment or a smile shared with another person or sitting with a grieving friend. Other times it's acts of kindness that help lift a person up in difficult times, like helping a person as they get back on their feet after personal struggles or helping a neighbor with yard work or housework when they're faced with personal limitations. Other times it's acts of generosity like sharing what we have to help others. We've done this ourselves when we fundraise and help to support a Syrian family, when we've worked together to get a local food bank running here in our community so that supports were available much closer to home. Even in the midst of the terrifying and heartbreaking headlines, there are stories of hope and love. Even now in the midst of war and destruction are stories of love coming out of Ukraine. Strangers in other parts of Europe who are opening their homes and communities to refugees. The fact that children's hospitals in a variety of countries, including our own, like sick kids in Toronto, is welcoming families with children who need urgent health care. Stories of people risking their lives to save a stranger. The list can go on. But what we must hold on to is that each and every act of kindness like these shows that love is stronger than evil. That death and destruction can be overcome. And so we find hope in the loving acts of others which remind us of our Christian faith and our Christian cause where we're called to trust in the new life Christ promises, while also working together to help see that come to life around us. And so as we approach the difficult days of Holy Week, open yourselves to hearing the stories, but hold on to the glimmers of hope that comes from our Easter faith. Remember that both in the Christian journey and in the journey of the life we lead, there is always more to come even if right now it's difficult to see. For we're not alone. Christ goes ahead of us and shines a light that we might find our way. And so as we wait and watch, let us place our trust in the one who is our comforter, our guide, our friend, Jesus the Christ. Amen. We'll now join in more voices 144, like a healing stream.
join in our affirmation of faith, which is found on the back covers of Voices United. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Now let us pray. We come before you, O God, hearts filled with thanks and praise. We give thanks for the many ways you walk with us through Christ. We give thanks that even as we wander, you are ever present. For we know that in you we can find refuge during the more difficult parts of our journey. Yet as we gather, we come carrying the burdens of our loved ones and the world. We come knowing that even as we seek to work towards a more just and loving world, violence and hatred still exist. We wonder, will it ever end? But then we turn to you, O oh God, and find your healing love. And so we pray that we might live into that love by continuing to seek peace and justice and by comforting one another. Hear us, we pray, as we now lift up to you those concerns we carry. For loved ones who struggle with illness, or who care for someone who is ill. For those who experience violence and hatred at home or in their community. For those who struggle with hunger, homelessness, or other financial concerns. For those who are caught up in acts of violence and war around the world. And for all who grieve. Hold all people in your tender, loving care. And guide us as we seek to be Christ's hands and feet in this world. Amen. Our minute for mission for today is entitled, Acting Together for Ukraine. We are stronger together, and what affects one of us affects all of us. These two truths have become even more apparent as the invasion of Ukraine continues to cost precious lives and rapidly create a humanitarian crisis. The United Nations reports that millions of people living in the Ukraine Displaced from their homes are seeking refuge in neighboring countries. Many have lost friends, loved ones, and property, struggle to meet their basic needs, and face an uncertain future. In the face of this growing crisis, communities of faith around the world are taking action to offer support. Spanning 127 countries, the Action by Churches Together Alliance, also known as ACT, is the world's largest network of Protestant and Orthodox churches and agencies, including the United Church. Your generosity through mission and service has long supported ACT's humanitarian relief and advocacy efforts. Right now, your ongoing support through mission and service, as well as special emergency gifts, are helping to provide shelter, clean water, food, and medical attention. What's more, the impacts of war in Ukraine are affecting food security for regions that depend on its agricultural production, including in some areas where global partners are responding. The new humanitarian news sites reports that Yemen imports half of its wheat from Ukraine and Russia. 22% of corn imported to Spain comes from Ukraine. And Lebanon relies on Ukraine for up to 60% of its wheat has only about a month's worth of reserves. Conflict is one of the main reasons that hunger is rising in the world. 
and Ukraine represents a stark example of how that happens, states Musu Taylor Lewis, Canadian Food Grains Bank Director of Resources and Public Engagement, in an interview. United Church moderator Richard Bott condemned the invasion in a statement released in early March, stating that the act of aggression contravenes the Charter of the United Nations and represents a serious violation of international law. We call on all parties to immediately cease hostilities and to undertake action to restore peace, he writes, urging the Church to hold the people of Ukraine in prayer and explore whether there is a Ukrainian Catholic Church, Ukrainian Orthodox Church, or Ukrainian Community Center close to you to whom you might write a letter of concern and solidarity, or extend solidarity to people of Ukrainian descent in your community. Thank you for all the ways you express compassion and care, and for faithfully supporting mission and service. By acting together, we can be there as a worldwide church community, when and where it matters most. And so now we pause to note and celebrate the gifts we share because we give, our, give of ourselves so that we might help create a more loving and just world. And so we raise these up, up these gifts to God in prayer. Let us pray. Take all that we offer, O God, and use it in your name. May what we give help bring new life to all people. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 703. In the ball, there is a flower. Thank mm -hmm. you.